I was drafted by the Eagles when I was in college. I played a little ball in college, and it was good enough for me to score a decent draft in the NFL, and the draft paid a good amount of money, and the good amount of money was something that was inspiring enough for me to accept the offer, even though I wanted to play for the Cowboys. But I didn't got the Cowboys, so I got the Eagles instead and I was being paid enough for me to forget about the Cowboys, and I later even negotiated to get the deal for me to consider them as my rivals. The game season started, and I was actually pretty excited to be in the green jersey and step into the gridiron and make everyone my biggest fan. I decided one thing to become the rock star of the NFL, and I never imagined the things to blow out of proportions. And when the time came, there was the glory of it all waiting for me, and things were big, and I didn't realize how big they actually were when I first saw what the perks of being an NFL player means. I was waiting in the lobby room of a hotel when a girl came closer to me and said, I know you from somewhere. And I looked at her and she was pretty. And I remembered I was blank and I tried talking, but the words weren't coming out of me. And she said, tell me, where do I remember you from? And I did not want to across a show off, so I said, here and there, I've been around a while. And she smiled and sat beside me and started talking to me. We talked for a while, and then she asked me to join her in her room, and I thought to myself, should I do what I'm about to do? Should I join this unknown woman in her room? And after thinking a while, I decided to let her go, and went on to my room, and later from there to practice. Since the suite I had in the hotel was part of my accommodation deal, I was spending most of my nights after the game in there. I often saw the girl lurking in the balconies of the hotel, and I assume maybe she works there or is acquainted or maybe even live in the same hotel, or at worst, I thought maybe she was a prostitute trying to make her way into the hotel where regularly rich people come and go. But the last assumption, I never really thought about that but once, since I never saw her interacting with anyone but me. It was always me, the glances, the smiles, the hellos and invitations. It was all limited for me and it made me feel special. So one day, I decided to go and ask her if she knows that I am in the NFL, and she looked at me and asked me, what is that? And I looked in her eyes, and I realized she had no clue about who I was or what NFL was or any of that, so I was certain that she wasn't one of them who lurks to get with influential people. The receptionist at the hotel might have seen me chatting up with that woman, because the next day, the receptionist came close to me and said, You have to be careful about the halls, sir. They might be old and they might be dangerous. It's best not to involve or indulge with them. And maybe she was just wanting me to stay away from the girl. I later asked the girl, The receptionist warned me about you. And she said, She's had it in for me forever. Don't mind her. She's a silly old goose. And then smiled and asked, When are you going to join me in my room? I replied, Soon if the time is right. I better know you inside and out before anything. And she said, just search Daniela and I everything she would be. I went back to my room and searched Daniela, and there was a story about the girl who died when her mother left her in the lobby of the same hotel that I was in. Danielle was five, and when she died in the hotel and she meant to be an actress, this all happened in the 1920s. Next day when I met the girl, I told her I read about Daniela, and it was pretty sad what happened to her, poor kid. So I asked her, so you wanted to be an actress like Daniela? And she replied, maybe, I think so, but it has been so long since then. I grew up with no one in this very hotel, and now it seems to have become a part of me. I asked her her name, and she said, call me anything. And we talked that night a lot. I could see a lot of stairs in the hotel, and mostly the stare of the receptionist. And as I saw the receptionist, she approached me and said, Don't listen to her, just leave. And I thought it was very rude of her, and I told her to back away from me, and she did politely, but she warned me once again. And the whole evening, I didn't even realize that I missed practice, and I was just talking to that girl. We went into my room, and I tried to get close to her, to hold her hand, or her, but she would just keep her distance. When I asked what's wrong, she said, Let's go to my room and be there. And I agreed, and we left from my room to her. Her room was at the 13th floor. I had no idea that the life went that high, and when we reached to her room, she opened her door and entered first, and then took off the gown she was wearing. 
and as she did, she called me closer to her. And as soon as I was about to step through the door, a hand pulled me back and jerk and power, and there it was, the receptionist. She pulled me away from the door, and I ignorantly shouted at her, What is your problem? And when she told me to look around, and I saw I was on the roof of the hotel, I asked her, Where's the 13th floor? And she said, shaking me and making me realize, There is no 13th floor. There are only six floors in this hotel. No 13th floor exists. You would have done the same mistake a lot of people have done. Don't ever get involved with Daniela. She will always seduce you into following her. And I realized. And when she explained me everything that just happened, I realized the horror of what just happened. The receptionist saved me from what would have been labeled as suicide. And she pulled me back to the world of the living. I couldn't have thanked her enough. And I took her out on a date. And from the day she saved me to the day I am getting into the NFL Hall of Fame 20 years later... I still owe my success to that lovely woman who saved my life back when she was not my wife. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. So I've been a football coach here in the UK for almost 30 years now. Once upon a time, I had a decent shot at playing in a professional level, and I even had trials at Man City when I was a teenager. This is before they had the oil money. I don't think I've gotten a sniff these days. But like so many other, horrible injury took me out of the picture, and I had to kiss my dreams goodbye. However, that didn't mean that I had to turn my back on football together. It's my life always has been, so I decided to get into a career in coaching instead. A few years later, I'm working for Marine AFC on Mary's side, mainly along a bloke that had to be double my age. He had bags upon bags, loads more experience in bags, load more contacts, and one day, it comes to me with the offer of a lifetime and it will made some has somehow managed to land the head coaching job for the national women's team. Billy's trouble was he needed two blokes to help him out. He'd asked his mate, who in turn asked me eight weeks after that. Following all kinds of vaccinations and travel forms, we were flying out to Belize City to become the official coaching staff of an actual national team. Granted, they just so happened to have never played a game before, but we saw that as more of a challenge than hindrance. But the trip turned out to be much more difficult than just coaching a few amateur footballers. In fact, it turned out to be a bloody nightmare for the entire time we were there. First off, and this isn't all that connected to the Belize thing, but our flight out of Belize happened to be on the 9th of September of 2001. So we spent our second full days in Belize, not maxing and relaxing by the pool as we should have been but glued to the telly in the hotel bar, watching footage of the plane smashing into for hours. And if our flight had been booked two days later, we would have been in the air during one of the most terrible events in our lifetime. So to say that shook us up would be an understatement of the century. Anyways, the main thing happened about two or three weeks later, once we'd gotten to the swing of our coaching job. Me and my colleague from Marine were staying in a fairly scabby hotel in Belize City, but the food and the drink were absolutely phenomenal. And it was all being paid for by a football federation of Belize, so it wasn't like beggars were about to suddenly become choosers. The only trouble was that it could get a bit wild later on at night. I saw more than one older European-looking bloke going into a room with a much more attractive Belizean girl, then leaving maybe half an hour to an hour later. Sleazy, I know. But as long as they didn't put them near us, we weren't fast. And only a few weeks into staying there, I'm woken up in the middle of a night by a repeated rhythmic bang on the wall near my headboard. And suddenly, I know what's going on and only makes me extra nauseous when I can hear some deep voice and American accent shouting all these pervy things. God help the girl he was with. I remember thinking, because she just stayed quiet as a mouse the whole time. And in the end, I ended up banging on the wall back and shouting, keep it down, Pallor, something of the short. He didn't oblige a bit, 
not stopping, but at least slowing the tempo while keeping his voice down. Still grim, but better than nothing, I suppose. The next morning, I get a knock on the door. It's the Belize police wanting to ask me a few questions. Of course I oblige, following the officer into the corridor. And that's when I see all the blood on the door of the room next to me. There are bloody handprints on the door. Blood all over the doorknob and bloody footprints leading away from it. The mad thing is, though, that would have all been cordoned off with tape in Britain. But the cops there just didn't seem to mind us contaminating the scene by standing right next to it. As it turned out, what had been listened to wasn't just, you know, that the bloke had strangled some poor girl before doing that to her body, just feet away from where I've been trying to sleep. You can bet we moved hotels after that. About a month later, our women's team took on their Guatemalan counterparts in their first ever international football match. We got smashed 12-0 two days later after we played El Salvador, and the results were much better. We only got beat by six goals to nil the president of the FFB sacked us after our post-match him talk. We tried to explain that having the number of goals that we were beaten by was actually quite an achievement for a brand new team. He didn't give a monkey's bare bottom. He just wanted wins, so we were out. We flew back to the UK in time for all the Christmas typing. I just remember spending and trying to forget about the murder. The whole thing was definitely one of the most surreal times in my life, and if it wasn't for the actual murder that I tried to sleep through, I'd definitely do it all again tomorrow. Super Bowl is the biggest event when it comes to sports in America. The top player of NFL, celebrities singing their chart-burst songs, and the whole nation sticking to the television screens, doing nothing but watching a game and watching these halftime shows that took over the television for that event. It is phenomenal, as it is when it comes to these halftime shows on television. But when you are out there in the stadium with thousands of people cheering and shouting for their teams and the group dynamic in the place is off the charts, I get to witness that dynamic firsthand when I was in the stadium during one of those Super Bowl events. It blew me away, and it was off the charts. There was so much fun in there, and we couldn't help but overstay as the events got over, and knowing that parking and getting out would cost us another two hours, we stayed still. As the game ended, and the stadium slowly emptied, me and my friends decided to get back, and we were so hyped and pumped by what we have witnessed that we couldn't help but talk about it all the way. And as we were busy talking about it, we didn't realize that we had no way to get back but by walking. The public transport had been closed, and the only way that seemed to be reasonable was either staying in the empty stadium that was almost impossible, it was around 12.05 in the night while my friends suggested that we should walk all the way to our homes, which was around 12 miles away. I thought it was a stupid idea knowing that there is a massive patch of forest in the way that have been notorious for many abductions in the past, and I decided that we should not try to get into that trouble that we can clearly avoid. But they were adamant that they will take the way, and decided that it doesn't matter. We are six, and together, no one can mess with us. And in that false sense of confidence, we decided that we will walk the way. I decided to put in the message before to my friends back in the dorm, just in case something happened. The first few miles were easy, because of the after rush of the game. We even tried to hitch a ride, but failed. No one was ready to hitchhike the six young college students. And so we walked, not caring much and talking very loudly on the empty roads. We easily cruised through the highway without any fear, altercations, or bad experience. And as we were reaching the end of the highway, there was a feeling creeping in me. And it was about the forest patch that was going to start. And in the very beginning of the patch, I could remember that Langley kid who hanged himself to the tree. I even knew the tree. It was the third tree in the right, and as I saw the tree, I remembered the image of him hanging. And then I remembered these murders of the Jones sisters that happened in the middle of the road, or how Claire was molested and brutally murdered in the middle of the very road that we were walking in. All these shit memories about the patch came into my mind, and they were not really helping me deal with the fear present that I was in. And as I walked, I started imagining things. 
I was talking to my friends. One of my friends had his arms around me, and when I looked to the right where my friends were, I saw all five of them walking on the right side of the road, but the hand around my arm was on the left side, and as I turned, I see on my left, I freaked out. It was the Langley kid. His neck was blue from the scar by the rope, and it freaked me out, and the fear just passed on to my friends, and they tried to understand what just happened. And they ignored me, calling me vividly imagining incidents, and then, one of them saw the two Jones sisters dancing in the middle of the road. And as we moved to the middle of the road, one was walking inside the forest. And I tried to stop them both, and they snapped out of it. And one of them saw the Jones sisters calling him, and the other one saw Claire calling him into the jungle. I realized what was happening, and decided to act before they come back. And I told them all to grip reality with all their might. I said, these beings want us to slip away. Let's just hold on to reality as tightly as we can, and we decide to hold our hands as we walked. And to cut the way short, we decide to sing loudly, and as we did, we felt less scared. And that was the one thing that kept us going, singing. But the thing is, all the time we were singing, these apparitions were right in front of us, looking at us, staring at us, and grunting at us, trying to intimidate us into submitting. But together... We were strong and would just not give in. As we were walking through the forest singing, I felt the hand of Langley around my neck, and I saw that it was leaving the mark there, and he whispered in my ear, You will have to come to us eventually, in the very way I did. Don't worry, I will be waiting, friend. And then he went away, and I remember every single apparition the boys were seeing went away. As the years passed by, we decided to forget about that incident. Super Bowl and NFL was something that we only saw on the television, and life went on to be that of living joys and sorrow, and it never came back to me. The story was almost forgotten, never to be remembered, until a few weeks ago. Then things got really rough, and to the point of no return. It was then, when I decided to contact one old friend that who was there on the trip with me, and we remembered that scary trip that we took, and I told him what happened on the final turn when Langley whispered in my ear, and he told me not to overthink. It was one of the moments of weakness in our life, but now I remember Langley was right on that horrifying night. I was raised over in Little John Island back in Maine. John has a small community of about 100 people just off the coast near Yarmouth. Technically speaking, it's long been incorporated into Yarmouth Township and all the island kid bus across the bridges to the high schools there, but try telling that to the islanders. We never say we're from Yarmouth when people ask where we're from. We answer Little John every time. Maybe it's the fact that we're cut off by the ocean. Maybe it's just the people who live there. But this strong sense of togetherness and independence on Little John, kind of like a siege mentality only without the siege. As I said, the island kids used to catch the bus across the Talbo Road and the Sandy Point bridges in order to get to school, which included me. It just so happened that my favorite teacher, Coach Collins, was also an islander, and he was my favorite teacher for two reasons. Not only did he teach history and coach the senior ice hockey team, but he was just an all-around nice guy too, and he used to give me a ride home after practice. Since walking home during a main winter night can almost be downright dangerous, Coach Collins was the kind of guy that kids like me really looked up to. He almost turned pro after playing hockey in college, won a bronze star in Vietnam, and unlike many of his colleagues, in a way of talking to his students that made you feel like he was your cool uncle or something, he was the best. No one had a bad word to say about him, and for a long, long time, Coach Collins occupied some mythical status in the town's collective consciousness. So it's March 7th, 1989. I remember the exact date because Dino Kikarelli was traded from the Minnesota North Stars to the Washington Capitals. He was the outlaw hockey player for a while, a complete jerk, but God could he shoot a puck. And it was all we talked about at practice at night. 
Then, in the middle of practice, I look and see my girlfriend's best friend Kelly standing at the edge of the ice. She starts calling me over, and when I get a chance, I skate over to see what she wants. Kelly tells me that my girlfriend wanted me to call her as soon as I got home. From the way Kelly was acting, I knew it wasn't going to be good news. Consequently, I'm totally distracted for the rest of practice. My shooting sucks, and I'm in a stinker of a mood. By the time it comes for Coach Collins to give me a ride home like usual, he does his regular approachable patriarch routine. He talks, he dishes out some wholesome advice, and suddenly I'm not catastrophizing so much anymore. I thank him, go inside, call on my girlfriend, and what are you now? She wants to break up. Coach's advice sort of stopped me from having a full-blown teenage heartbreak moment, but I was still upset. Only I couldn't just sit around eating ice cream and feeling sorry for myself. That was masculine upset. I was troubled, so to speak. I figured I'd steal one of my dad's beers and go for a walk in the woods, maybe stand out on Madeline Point looking all broody and such. So that's exactly what I did. Looking back on it, it was just puppy love, no big deal. But as I said, it bruised my ego enough to feel like heartbreak, and that's all that mattered, I suppose. Either way, I found myself wishing I could talk to Coach Collins about it again. A guy like that had seen and experienced so much, and he still managed to come home and start a happy, functional family. He'd know what to say. He'd know what it was I had to do. I'm almost a Madeline point, and I'm right where there's a kind of fork in the dirt road. One way leads to the water. The other is the overgrown driveway of a long-abandoned house. Now, the sun hasn't quite set by that time, and there's still a little bit of that blue twilight in the sky and it gives the rotting old structure this awesomely creepy vibe. So creepy, in fact, that I almost soiled my pants when I heard some car horn let out the short, sharp horn from somewhere real close by. I had no idea anyone else was around. The whole point of walking out that far towards Madeline Point was so I could be on my own. And since the place was normally deserted during the drizzly main springtime, I was kind of spooked that anyone was there at all. But by that point, I'm a little buzzed and naturally curious, so I started cautiously padding off down the overgrown driveway, trying to find the source of the honk, when I finally saw the truck that seemed to be parked deliberately out of sight among the trees. I couldn't believe my eyes. Remember how I said I wish I had Coach Collins to talk to, that I could have really used some of that wholesome cool uncle advice he'd always had on hand? Well, guess what? Like some miraculous act of God, whose truck should I find parked in the trees but Coach Collins? This is weirdly comic moments at first when I'm super happy to see his truck. But I also realize I'm carrying the beer I stole from my dad. I dart back out of sight, toss the beer, then start chomping on the stick to double mint that I've been carrying to get the smell of booze off my breath. I'm just about to come back around the trees for a second time when the passenger door of the coach's truck swings open. I watch as someone basically falls out of it, stumbles through the feet, then leans up against a tree and starts puking. I could tell right away it wasn't Coach Collins. It actually looked like a girl, and it was confirmed when I heard the kind of high-pitched puking sound she made. Okay, I realize that might sound weird, but guys and girls puke different. It is what it is. But anyway, I started like straining my eyes to see who it is. Light is getting pretty low at that point, and without being able to see behind the mess of long hair, it was hard to tell exactly who it was. But then I hear Coach Collins saying something from inside the truck. Only, it didn't sound like the Coach Collins I knew the back in the truck. Maria. Then I realized who it was. Maria and I had chemistry together. So I had spoke to her once or twice, and she'd been a cheerleader for like the longest time until recently dropping out of her squad. Her dropping out of the squad had coincided with a decline in her GPA and an overall odd shift in her behavior. A bunch of rumors went around that ran the spectrum of patiently ridiculous to sinisterly believable, but the truth had remained in the dark. He had something was definitely having a negative effect on Maria. And there came a moment when I realized I might have just found out what that thing was. In among the trees, 
maybe 40 or 50 feet away. I watched Maria wiping her mouth before the coach yelled something at her from the driver's seat. Don't make me tell you again, Maria. Get back in the truck. Maria seemed to be fighting back tears, like getting back in the truck was the last thing on earth she wanted to do. Then I literally can't believe what I'm seeing, as she turns, tug on her jeans a little that buttons and close. I'm glad I don't have to explain the connotation of that because even after all these years later, the idea still makes my skin crawl. Only as Maria turns, I must have been leaning too far out from the tree I'm using for cover because there's this one horrible moment where we both just lock eyes for a second. I assume I'm busted, so I start edging away before breaking into a run back toward Cousin Street. As I'm running, I keep expecting to hear the truck revving its engine, either to follow me or take off to avoid being seen again. But nothing happens. I just run, and run, and run, until I reach the Talbo Road bridge that led back to Little John and home. Once I was home and had calmed down a bit, I started to wonder why I ran in the first place. I know it sounds horrible. In retrospect, the way Coach was talking to Maria should have told me everything I needed to know. There was a lack of empathy that she was vomiting, not to mention the question why she was vomiting in the first place. But I was young, scared, and embarrassingly drunk off of one beer. So I tried to rationalize. I didn't even really see Coach Collins, and it's possible that someone else in the area owned a truck the same model as his. Sure, the voice sounded like him, but that didn't mean it was. Besides, if something shady was going on, surely Maria would have told me since she'd seen me and all. But thinking of it, had she seen me, maybe I just imagined she had. And if they were doing something awful, why not speed off or give chase? There was a lot that I could interpret as being totally harmless, but there was a disturbing amount that indicated that what I had seen was something very, very wrong. But then, what was had to be do about it? Accuse Coach Collins, the small town war hero, a father, a husband, the best hockey coach in the Northeast, of being a freaking predator? That was unthinkable to me. What if I accused him and there was a perfectly reasonable explanation? I'd be a pariah. I wouldn't be able to show my face around town, let alone at hockey practice. The same hockey practice I love had and he coached? I'm sorry to ramble. I just need you to understand my mindset about it and why I kept so quiet about the whole thing for like a straight week. I know it was the wrong play. And to everyone reading this, especially to Maria, and sorry, you just have to understand. I figure if anything was going to go down, it'd be the next day at school. Maybe Maria would confront me about spying on her or something. I had no idea. Everything was still so unclear at the time, hence my hesitancy to act on it. But nothing happened. No one said anything. Coach Collins passed me in the hallway and just said morning like he normally did. I tried to act normal about it. I tried to push it all way in the back of my mind. But I've never been very good at hiding the way I feel. I know people notice the change in my attitude. Mother weekend. My mom was asking why I was being so quiet. I told her I was just tired, but I guess it's because it's the only thing I wanted to talk about was off limits. I especially couldn't act the same around Coach Collins, and it was only when I went to check out his truck after school that I got any sense of reassurance. I noticed that there was this big Support Our Troops sticker on his back bumper, something I didn't remember seeing on the trunk in the woods that day. But as much as I tried to ignore it, the fact remains that I simply may not have noticed it at the time, because understandably, I was very much distracted by other events. But still, I kept my mouth shut, and actually took a few more days before I actually did anything about it. The day I broke was exactly a week after the event for seven nights straight. All I thought about before I drifted off into an uneasy sleep was the possibility of Coach Collins being the voice in the truck of how if he was doing something seriously evil to Maria right under the noses of everyone in town, then I had to do something about it. I wouldn't be able to live with myself otherwise. So I decided to approach Maria. 
I couldn't just ask who she was with promise to keep my mouth shut and live with the consequences. I didn't have to drop Coach Collins' name, and I could just gauge her reaction to the question. And when I looked at it like that, it seemed all easy and simple. I mean, she told me if she needed help, right? And that's what I did. I came up with Maria after chemistry one afternoon, asked if I could talk to her in private, apologized for what I was about to ask, then just hit her with it. Who were you with near the power station last week? The way she looked at me at first made me think she was about to just deny it. This mocking and crazy kind of look. I cut her off with, I know as you, I saw you. And you saw me too. I just need to know who you were with. After that, all her bluster just melted away. And the confident ex-cheerleader began to look like a scared little girl. No one, she said. And just walked off towards lockers. I tried one more time to talk to her about it, but as she walked past me in the school parking lot, all she had to say to me was, leave me alone. That was the crushing moment that I realized that my worst fears had come true. And then nothing about little John could ever be the same for me ever again. The trouble was, I was at something of an impasse. Even if I did tell the cops about the coach, she'd have to actually want to talk to someone about it. Otherwise, all I had was a baseless accusation that might ruin my life completely. If I was going to do anything, it needed to be well-planned and delicately executed. But just what that was, I had no idea at the time. And the week since I saw Murray in the woods, I had skipped hockey practice twice. And the times I showed up, I ducked Coach Collins when he asked me about my usual ride home. But that evening, when I fumbled for some excuse about going over to a friend's house to study, he said something that made my stomach tie itself into a knot. Get in the truck. The tone was almost the exact same as he had been in the woods previously. If there was any doubt still left in my mind, there wasn't after that. Part of me wanted to just get in the truck and go back to pretending like I hadn't seen anything. Or if I did, it was all perfectly explainable. But the other part of me, the rational part, told me that getting in Coach Collins' truck was a very, very bad idea. I told him no. Nothing else. Just one solitary no. And what followed were a few moments of silence as I saw a look come over the coach's face that I'd never seen before. He became cold, expressionless, and only later did it occur to me that what I was looking at might have been the last thing one or two Viet Cong gorillas saw before. You know? Then he spoke. Have you got something you want to ask me, son? I just shook my head. Good because being so close to graduating, it would be a shame if anything were to keep you from your studies, wouldn't? He said and waited for a response, and I didn't say a thing in reply. Kid like you has a lot of potential. You can enroll in some fancy college across the country, get some well-paid big city job and just leave little John behind. Never look back. You understand me? The horrible thing was, I didn't understand. I heard what he said, and I saw the appeal. But I hated him. I felt betrayed, and I wanted everyone to know he was a liar, a cheat, and a predator. So after a week of doing nothing, I finally went home and told my mom I know it was something I should have done a week prior. It was obvious just from how tactical she knew how to handle the situation. She drove over to Maria's house, talked to Maria's mom. In private, she was quick to add. Then the pair of them approached Maria, and just I didn't even know, used their mom magic to just coax it out of her. But the time she got home around 10, just three hours after she left, she said Maria and her mom were ready to go to the police. Only the thing is, Unlike Hollywood movies, where there's usually some big resolution and everyone gets their just desserts, etc., this story doesn't have a real end to it. Coach Collins was questioned by police, but since the DEA or judge whoever didn't think there was enough evidence to push for a trial, 
the coach was never arrested or charged with anything. Maria, on the other hand, died in a car accident where the other driver was twice over the legal limit, just smashed into her and her sister while they were coming back from Portland one night. It was a horrific tragedy and meant that whatever secrets Maria had went to her grave with her. But the cherry on top is not only was Coach Collins never punished for what he did, but he was right about me. I went into a college on Seattle, ended up getting a job here in Oregon. Mom and Dad moved into Portland as they got older, so I've not been back to Little John in almost 20 years now, and honestly, I'd like to keep it that way. I can't stand small towns in general anymore. My wife thinks that's cutesy and kitsch, but only because she grew up in Chicago. Me? I know how small towns work. I know they all have dark secrets buried just below the surface. But unlike big cities where bad things happen all the time, people just don't see it. In small towns, people know all about the bad things, and it's not that they can't see it, they just choose not to.